Okay. Uh, I think Elliot has joined us. Elliot, how are you doing today, my friend? Okay. I'm just wondering how you guys are getting your hair cut. I really need one. I need to get one, too. Uh, we talked about that yesterday, you know. I, I just uh, posted yeah, a... I have to look at myself. I look like Einstein. It's it's very weird. You look better than I do. I mean, I, I, like, <laughs> I need a shave. Anyway, uh, Elliot, as you can tell, we're, we're flying by the seat of our pants. The good thing about it is, is that you get freaking fly, flyer miles for, for doing this, so... <laughs> But you want to use them? But you want to use them for your wardrobe? Hey, hold a second, would you? Oh, I sure. Hear a ringing phone. I'll be right back. No Get problem. Our um, our guest has gotten a phone call, but he'll be back in just a moment. Um, it's Kenny. Well, for folks who don't know me, my name is Dan Johnson. Uh, you may have seen I'm me this weekend. And I'm sitting on uh, on the Zoom call on the Zoom rigmarole. Come on aboard. We'll take you too. Okay. All right. Bye bye. Kenny's mixed up with his schedule too, so he's coming. <laughs> okay. Well, no problem. I, I can fill in until then. Uh, for folks who do not know uh, the gentleman on the screen, this is Elliot S. Megan. Uh, Elliot is one of the premier uh, Superman writers during the Bronze Age of Comics from the 70s to the 80s. Uh, as I said in a panel I did yesterday, uh, Elliot was one of the writers that I grew up reading when I was a kid, doing Superman comic books. And I would consider him and Carrie Bates my two Superman writers. Um, Elliot uh, has also done a couple of Superman novels, uh, Last Son of Krypton and uh, Miracle Monday. And you've also uh, branched out in doing your own books at this time. Yeah, and television, movies, uh, just just a wide variety of things. So, I would just ask, uh, just kind of let folks know how uh, how you got into the Superman comic books. How did you start writing for those? Well, um, I kind of got lucky. Is all. Um, I did a term paper uh, that involved the Green Arrow story. And, Paper. I got a, a B plus on the paper. Wikipedia says B minus, but it was B plus. Yeah. And, uh, and I argued with my professor about whether it deserved an A. And um, he said, uh, well, he understood it was going to be illustrated too. I said, no, that wasn't the understanding. <laughs> but he let the grade stand. So I, my, my, my argument was, uh, if you write a term paper as part of a if you write a comic book as part of a history paper, uh, you get an A or an F. You don't get a B plus. So, uh, so I sent it to Carmine in Pentino. And he gives it to Julie, and Julie gives it to Neil Adams, and Neil read it on the train and came back the next day and said he wanted to draw it. So, uh, so that turned into a job for a long time. Um, but just around that time, Danny O'Neill decided he didn't want to write Superman anymore. He never wanted to write Superman. He didn't like the character. He thought Superman was more realistic. I told him that wasn't the case. <laughs> I told him Superman was much more realistic character than Batman. And it doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's fantasy, for heaven's sakes. So he spent the next 10,000 years, right, until two days ago, writing Batman stories. Yeah. Um, and that's how I got started writing Superman. Julie said, can you handle the Superman story? I said, yeah. yeah. He said, that's the, that's the hardest character to write. I said, okay, I believe you. Um, and I wrote it for a few years before I realized it wasn't the hardest character to write. You just had to take the right approach, which nobody else was doing except Gary. Gary, Gary got it. We used to go out to the, uh, to the Hilltop Diner in Queens at midnight and sit there drinking coffee till four in the morning, annoying the hell out of everybody, uh, talking about stories. And uh, I just talked to Carrie the day before or yesterday. Yesterday, I called him to tell him that, that Denny had died. Um, so I, it was the first time I talked to him in about two years, I think. He sounded good. He sounded good. He sounded in, in good shape. Uh, I think it's the first time he's actually answered the phone in 40 years before I said, it's Elliot. We have the phone. Oh, wow. So that's a good sign. It could be, you know, he might go down the street and get Starbucks 
in public sometime. But other than that, um, he's the same old guy. I'm, I'm just sorry it took uh, Denny's death to reconnect you guys like that. I'm just, that's, that's the way it goes sometimes, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask, uh, were you a Superman fan before you started writing for the comics? Sure. I loved it. Um, I wrote, wrote a bunch of stuff um, about it in college. Uh, I wrote a I wrote a humanities paper um, comparing him to Odysseus. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I got an A on that one. That was good. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Love that stuff. I thought he was a quintessential American character, um, like Thor for, for the Norse and Zeus for the, for the Romans or for the Greeks. Um, and I kept, I kept comparing him to mythological figures and eventually I got to make a living from it. So that's where that came from. I was gonna say, um, I have heard a lot of um, comic historians, comic writers talk about how comic books or superheroes were our American mythology. Yeah. And so in a lot of ways, I mean, Superman is definitely like in the pantheon of the gods, he's definitely Zeus in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, he's, yeah. Yes, there's, there's, a, there's a direct line. Uh, there, there are all these mythological norms uh, that have taught us how to, how to write stories. And, and the reason we write stories based on mythological norms is, I'm sure there were bullshit stories about Zeus uh, thousands of years ago that never stuck. The stories that stuck are the ones that were consistent with the hard wiring in the human brain. Um, so we learned how to write stories as stories, any stories, uh, based on based on what worked in in ancient mythology, and I I just kind of applied all that stuff consciously to Superman. Now I do have a question for you, Elliot. Uh, I've asked you this before, so now you can let everybody know. Out of both your story, Last Sign of Krypton and Miracle Monday, which one would you like? see made into either a live action movie or animated movie, and why? Well, I'd like to see Miracle Monday made into a, a live action movie. Always have. I submitted a, um, a synopsis for it years and years and years ago. Uh, never got, uh, got a response on it. Can't even remember who I sent it to, but I don't think he's in the picture anymore, whoever it was. Um, I just think it's a coherent story. Uh, and, 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 and one of the things that makes it appropriate to now, I think, is that it redeems the character from, um, from the dark, brooding, nonsensical figure that Superman isn't, that's been uh, dominant in the movies the last few iterations. Um, it, 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 you know, he reinforces, in Miracle Monday, he reinforces his code against killing. Uh, and that's the biggest thing about it. Um, there's always a solution. Um, and it's, what I tried to do in that book was apply something that wouldn't occur to people as a solution um, to the situation he was in, and he managed to come out uh, the winner. I, I think I think that would go a long way to redeeming the the movie character that we've been tossing around and arguing about. Now, who would you, you know, if you were say casting this yourself and it was approved and it was ready to be made and everything, who would you see as portraying the main characters well, that the, had been turned into a movie? That British kid is okay. <laughs> it bothers me. I don't think Superman breaks for tea. I think that's a big deal, but it's not a really big deal. Um, anybody like in history or or, or just uh, people well, that just, are now? like the the ones that you've seen? Like, would you have liked to see have seen Chris back when he was still portraying the character back then, or somebody mm -hmm. different like Brandon Routh or you know Dean Kane or whoever? Brandon's great. I like Brandon. Uh, he had an awful script to work with. Um, 
I mean, it wasn't a Superman story. It was a Lois story, which is fine, I guess. Um, George Reeves. <laughs> I think that's the guy. Um, the good thing about George, you, you got a, you got a panel coming up, or maybe you did it, where people talked about who's the best Superman portrayer. Is that is that is that something you guys are doing later on? Uh, sounds like something we're doing later on. I'm uh, all my energy was focused on this panel, and I came in late to the story because of a mix-up. So that's all right. Know, my apologies for everyone to that, uh, but mix, it happened. The mix-up was third party, I think. So I, I think we're uh, early. It happens. We're all good. But yeah. uh, no, you know, for me, I grew up with Chris. I, I'm not actually. I'm not going to say I'm partial to him, even though it would sound like I am, because I grew up with him and Margo as being Superman, Clark Kent, Lois Lane, and you know, just like Jackie Cooper being Perry White. You know, I'm not against anybody else who we have now in the movies, but at the same time, though, it's like people who grew up with George Reeves. You know, if you ask anybody that grew up with George Reeves, they're going to tell you, oh, yeah, George is the only one who played Superman good. That's not, that's not right. That, George was great. He was the best, as far as I'm concerned, but not because he was the Superman when I was a kid. The reason is... They had, they had, I think, a $50 special effects budget on that show. For each episode, they were allowed to spend 50 bucks to, to do an action scene. Um, so when he walked through a wall, or when he crashed through bricks, or when he did anything that involved building something, he had one shot. Exactly. Well, uh, see, that, that's the thing, that's too. That you... any of these other guys. Chris was, Chris Reed was classically trained, just as George was, but uh, he had the advantage of, of having a director who could yell, cut, let's do that again. George didn't have that. They had to do well, it from the top, and they had to do it right. And you've got things now, such as, uh, you know, back then, like you said, they had a $50 budget for the action scene, which in today's currency would probably be a million dollars or more. I don't, you know. No, 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 no. Maybe, but, you know, <laughs> maybe three. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not the best at stuff like that, figuring it out. But, you know, even even then, you know, you got to think, even back then on a movie compared to TV series, of course, the movies always had more money than what they had like a TV show did at the time, you know. And then again, it may have been they both had the same amount at the same time. I'm not sure. I didn't grow up during those days, so I don't know. But, you know, movie going budgets, back to the... Movie budgets are never accurate. What you hear that it took to make a, a given movie is always more than, than it was, really. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, like, going back to, like, for me, I grew up with Chris. He's the one that did it for me, and I, I had already been a Superman fan for as long as I can remember when it came time for comics. See, now, I was I was literally just born about the same time that you came in and started writing stories on Superman. Yeah. What what year did you get started as officially being with DC and writing Superman? 70, 71. I think the first story came out in 71. See, I was born in September of 75, so I was... He's in the comrade of the Superman. You're older than I thought. Wait. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I, I came in late to your game of your stories, but I, I still read your stories even as a little kid growing up and everything. And Superman when, when Superman the movie came out, it was December of 78. I think I mm -hmm. may have watched it when it came out. We had a drive-in theater at the time, so I think it was closer to spring or summer when I got to see the movie when it came out. And, uh, but going back to the thing, you know, I was always a huge fan of Superman until I saw that movie, and then that movie is what really pushed me over the edge of being that fan right. and collector that I tell people that I become, you know. And 
and I'll stick with that story. It's probably going to be etched on my headstone when they lay me to rest. He was a Superman fan since then. But, uh, you know, I, I've also seen Brandon. I've also seen Dean. I've also seen Henry do what, you know, they, they brought their own unique style of the character and made it their own. Like you said, Brandon didn't have a good script to work with. But as far as Superman Clark Kent, he nailed it as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, Dean had his own particular take when he had it for the TV show. Just like the people who do the voiceovers for the character from the animated stuff. You know, each person makes it their own. So, you know, it, it's kind of hard to say who you have as a favorite as far as live action and animated goes, because there's been so many great people out there who's made the character their own and brought a unique style to it. You know, even, even George, I mean, like I said, I never grew up with George, but, or Kirk Allen for that reason, but I went back and saw some of their work and I enjoy their work, even though that was way before my time. You got to look know? at it in context though. Nobody had ever seen anything like it in 1955, you know. Um, exactly. Well, and, and television was still a new, was still relatively a new thing taking off all over the world, you know. You know, back I then. My parents grew up without television. I couldn't, I couldn't understand what they would do at the end of the day. <laughs> they come exactly. from and 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 you know pick eggs or something i don't know that's yeah yeah that's the thing you know it's like back then you listen to the radio and i'm like i listen to the radio i don't see what the big deal is you know but back then that's all they had that was your main form of entertainment besides you know if the motion pictures were you know that's like kirk allen did the movie serials back then from what i was told from my father and people close to his age if you had the time to do it, every Saturday, you were at the movie theater, but it was just like watching a TV show, only you had so many chapters in a day that you would watch until that movie serial was finished. Right. And that's how you did it. You know, basically, the movie serials was like TV before TV came into your house. You know, it's like you went to the theater to watch TV, even though it wasn't really TV, but it was, it was setting up for the TV experience, I guess you would say. Maybe. And... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've, had a lot of people, I've had a lot of people tell me, oh, I don't think you're right on that, or, oh, yeah, I agree. It's just how you look at it. But from your point of view, uh, getting back on the subject, uh, whenever you uh, first came in and started writing Superman stories, did you know that that's what you wanted to do before you got into writing? No. Or was it just something that just basically fell in your lap at that moment? You know, I, I, I obviously I had some initiative. I wrote, I wrote the story and sent it to DC, but I mean, if Julie hadn't written that acceptance letter, I would have gone to law school. As it was, I went to journalism school um, while I was writing uh, the series, but uh, yeah. I'm, well, I, I'm one of these overeducated quads that uh, Pretty much. Well, I for one, I for one can honestly say that I love both your books. Thank you. I, I've read, I've read them over and over. Of course, you autographed all three of them for me when you were in Metropolis a few years back. Yeah. And uh, some of the best writing I've ever, and I, I don't read a lot of books. Not that I don't understand or anything like that, but you know, growing up out here in the country, you had more stuff to do outside than you did being inside reading a book or watching TV, stuff like that, of course. I got a, I got a eighth of an acre lot and I raised bees. That's as close as I get to the country. I have three beehives in the backyard. Uh, I'm allergic to bees, so that... Don't go near my beehives then. I, I'll make sure to stay away from your backyard. Have uh, you read this one? I have not had a chance to read that one yet. I need to get a copy of that and... Uh, and read it. It's about uh, real people who don't fly under their own power. Cool. I'm in the middle of uh, 
of taping it for the the podcast. Oh, uh, of course. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you about your podcast too. Uh, you can see how up to date I am with trying to moderate a panel. You know, <laughs> the podcast thing. Uh, there's a lot of people jumping on what would be called the bandwagon of podcasts. You've got sure. you've got celebrities such as Michael Rosenbaum who played. Right. Lex Luthor from Smallville and The Flash on Justice League. Everybody's doing a podcast these days, which, I'm, again, I don't listen to a lot of podcasts, but I try and listen to as many as I can, and I'm really behind on yours because this, this is the busiest time of year for me. Being I, haven't, right now. I haven't released one in about a year. I've been working on this uh, a thousand other things. But uh, okay. I, can... I, know, I know last time we spoke that you were – working on stuff uh but yeah you know it, podcast is another way of i guess letting people know that who you are and what you're into and there's another good way of getting yourself out there would you agree with that A.J. Liebling was a Maybe. Liebling he was a journalist in the 40s and 50s he was a sportscaster sports uh, writer and so forth, and political writer. He used to say, power of the press is guaranteed only to those who own one. And uh, what I'm finding now is that everybody owns one. So you can have Michael Rosenbaum putting out his own material and, and me, likes to me putting out um, what I'm writing down. Uh, it's, a uh, new, it's a new concept. And, and as many people, as many people take advantage of it, the better we're going to be. Exactly. Uh, when you uh, came into the store writing the novel, I guess, or helping out as you did, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but when uh, Kingdom Come came out, uh, how were you approached to, were you approached by certain people saying we... Yeah, my, Mark, uh, Mark Wade called me up and said... Um, have you read Kingdom Come? And I said, no. And this was when the second book had just come out. He said, well, we're going to do a novelization of it. Um, and we want you to write it. I said, who's we? He says, oh, just me. <laughs> he, he was the only one. Um, apparently, Jeff Loeb suggested to him that he calls me, and he thought it was like a revelation. But uh, I said, well, I'll probably read it. I'd be glad if you sent it to me, but I'll go out and buy it if you want. But I don't think I'm going to write the book, you know, not unless I can get the same deal on it as I got on Miracle Monday. He said, well, they don't do that anymore. I said, no, I know they don't. Um, so uh, I said, well, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to write it. He says, well, just read it. I said, of course I'll read it. So he sent me the first two issues. He sent me pencils on the third one and just, the script on the fourth. Um, and I read it and I liked it. I told him I'd like it because I liked the sensibility about these things. Uh, I really liked it. And uh, I get to the end of the fourth book and he dedicated the damn thing to me. So I called him up. I said, you put me in a hell of a bargaining position. <laughs> I can't not write this now. Um, so I did. And they gave and me ended up the standard book contract they give everybody these days, which means we get everything and you get nothing, but we get to put your name on it um, and then do whatever we want with it. So it's I was talking, What? I'm sorry? I was talking with a artist friend of mine and a story writer that wrote Superman Earth. He, he did the artwork for Superman Earth 1, Volumes 1 and 2, Shane Davis. He's a, he's a well-known yeah. artist and writer too and uh he he kind of gave the similar point to like when you walk into a walmart or you walk into a target or a bookstore and you see something there that that has your work on it but they didn't tell you that they were re-releasing it or they put it out like they put one of your pictures of your artwork on a t-shirt or a poster but you didn't know anything about it you didn't make any money off of that it's your artwork or it's your something that you had a hand in. They're, they're pretty you know, careful about that now. I mean, yeah. every once in a while I see something come out that 
I don't remember having gotten paid for some reprint book or something. And I call and I, and they make sure, I mean, they're, they're supposed to send me copies of everything they publish with my name on it and they don't. But uh, so when I see something that I haven't gotten a copy of, I call and find out, you know, did I get paid for this? Invariably I did, but they should send copies. They should be better about that. Well, see, that's what got me. Like you have people now, like, or companies now, like Amazon who can reprint, they can reprint your stories, whether it was Last Sign of Krypton, Miracle Monday, the novelization to the Kingdom Come, or they can put it out as an ebook or something like that. And yeah. I didn't know if, I didn't know if they had to call you up like call you directly or they call DC directly and say, hey, can we do this or can we not do this? Or how how's that go down that way? It's DC's point of view that they own everything. So they do it and they tell you they did it. Um, so with uh, Miracle Monday, I had a, have a contract that says I can do it. Um, but that goes back to 1981. So I did it. I, I, I reissued Miracle Monday and, and um, just based on the, the contract. And I showed up at conventions with copies of the books and it was on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Olibris. Um, and my lawyer is a, is a big comic book fan. He, uh, he always goes to San Diego. So one year I was in San Diego, I was selling, um, I was sitting behind a table selling copies of Miracle Monday and Last Son of Krypton. And, um, some kid came by and said he was a lawyer for DC. Uh, he's on the legal staff and he wanted to buy a copy of the book because he was a big fan. I said, okay, you're gonna sue me over it? And he said, no, 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 I just want to buy a copy because I'm a big fan. So I called up my lawyer and got him to come over and sold him a copy because he had actual money. But um, called my lawyer and he came by and he says, oh yeah, they're gonna sue you. I said, really? That'll be fun. He says, yeah, we'll, we'll have a great time. But uh, he said, for sure, they're gonna sue you. And they, this was three years ago, at least. So they, they haven't yet. Um, I shouldn't say that because I'm tempting fate. But yeah, um, they just do it if they wanna do it. So in this case, I just did it too. Well, you know, it, not to knock any company or anything like that, but it seemed like, to me, it seemed like somewhere down the road, somebody's getting treated unfairly. Like if they do it and you didn't make any money off of it, but you're you contributed or whatever, you know, it's like, and, and that could just be me. I'm old school. You know, I was raised to believe if you work on something hard enough, you know, you can be proud of it and you know, whatever happens with it. But at same time I was also told don't ever let anybody take advantage of you either and uh, not I'm not saying anybody's took advantage of you or you haven't taken advantage of anybody else or anything like that but at the same time it seems like the way it is especially the way that Shane was telling me here a while back he says it is kind of disappointing knowing that you didn't know this image was on a t-shirt or a poster or they re-released they re something and you you didn't know about it and you never got paid for it. They can say, oh, well, it was an oversight. We didn't know. Next time it happens, we'll let you know. But then it happens again the next time or whatever. <laughs> you know. I was there over there for a couple of years and it was a job I didn't like. But uh, one of the things I did like about it was um, they're pretty good about making sure you paid people for what you used. So if you're going to reprint something as an image on a, on a letters page, say, you had to make sure it got invoiced and, and the accountants knew to send the money. So, so they're much better at that than, obviously, than they used to be. They were awful at it in the 50s and 60s. But they're much better about it now. Somebody asked me, um, what are we gonna do about this Superman story that was written in like 1945? We wanna reprint it, but there's no credit on it. We can't figure out who wrote it or drew it. And I said, uh, well, if there's no credit on a Superman story, you send the money to Siegel and Schuster. Um, okay. And they said, oh, that's an idea. So that's what they've been doing ever since. 
I felt like that was my, other than, you know, an article I wrote or something, that was my contribution to their uh, continued copyright. Looking back, look, looking back at everything that you've done in the world of Superman and comic books in general, would you have ever thought in your head, just by seeing it from your point of view, that it, that the character of Superman and Batman and all these other characters would take off like they did since they're since they were first created, especially when it comes to like the Hollywood movies and blockbusters. I, I came into it. I came into it. You know, I mean, Superman's about ten years older than I am, so it was a pretty big deal when I got involved with it, and and it was growing. Um, it it seemed clear that 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 this was going to happen eventually. I mean, I used to make fun of people who, who claim that there should be a movie on this and there should be a movie on a TV show about this. I said, you want a Captain Canuck movie too? Remember Captain Canuck? I See? remember him. Huh? Yeah? I remember that name. Yeah. Um, but it's almost happened. So it's almost as big now as I thought it was going to get. And, um, and, you know, seeing, seeing your place in history, because if we're honestly looking at it like this, they're just not comic book characters like, oh, well, there's a Superman story, there's a Batman story, whatever. They're, they're truly iconic characters now. They're a part of our American culture, if you will. Some of them are. Not just, not just American culture, it's worldwide phenomenon. You know, uh, I've got friends just as you do that live in Australia who are huge Superman fans. I've got friends who live in Mexico who are big Superman fans. I've got people in Canada who are huge Superman fans, you know. London, England, all across this world, when they say Superman, they know who you're talking about. You say Batman, they know who you're talking about, you know. And not just the comic strips themselves and the comic books, but they also, like, I can bring up your name. Okay, do you know who Elliot S. Magan is? Oh, man, Last Sign of Krypton, Miracle Monday. You know, uh, uh, Kingdom Come, you know, all that good stuff. Oh, yeah, and all the stories he wrote in comic books back then. He's one of the best writers ever had for DC, you know? <laughs> and uh, they're like, this is guy Hemingway. He was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it, and that's the thing, you know. They're like, they're like, some people. You say your name, and they're like, oh yeah, I know him just like I know who I am. And then of course you have some people who are new to the game, and they're like, who's that? Never heard of them, you know, because they're just now getting into the ball game of what they're like and who they don't like and stuff like that, you know. And uh, you know. I've been told that trying to get your leg in the door at DC, whether you're a writer or up and coming writer or a artist that's trying to get your foot in the door to say, Hey, this is what I've done. Some people have told me it's the hardest thing that you will ever do. But then other people have said for me, it was just like they opened the door and said, we know who you are. You don't even have to ask us, come on in. We want you. You gotta have, you gotta have credits these days. And even when I started, it was a fluke that I, that I got in because Neil didn't fall asleep on the subway like he normally did. Um, so he read my script. It's not something that normally happens. Exactly. Uh, hmm? I say exactly. Yeah. So a lot of the reason people write and draw comics is because it's fun. Um, it sure doesn't, it's sure not the money. <laughs> you know, I, I, got a, I got a job about 20 years ago at Kaiser as a scheme to get my kids through college. Um, and that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. But, um, and I needed to do that. They're all safely through college and, and um, one's, a, one's a doctor, one's a teacher. So I, I don't have to worry about that anymore. But uh, so now I'm so, sensibly writing full time, except mostly I'm sitting in a in a house like a bear in a cave. 
Nothing care. wrong with that these days either. No, that's what it's for. Uh, last question from me, because I think we've got another panel coming up here. Uh, what advice would you give someone who was, I don't know, trying to make their mark? Not, not even in the world of comic books, just like if somebody was trying to get a book out there that they thought people would like to read or writing a screenplay for a movie or even in comics in general, what advice would you have for the generations of people who are trying to be the next big thing, I guess, if you will? Okay. Don't even think about being the next big thing in any field at all. But what you got to do is get something done. Finish it. Write the beginning, the middle, and the end. Draw the beginning, the middle, and the end. Make the movie um, with the $30 in your pocket and all your friends. Um, get to the end of any project, of one project. And if it doesn't sell right away, get started on the next one. Um, Y'all Stephen King fans? He wrote a new book called, uh, what's the new book? If It Bleeds. It's a book of stories. The last story in it is about this guy who teaches English somewhere. And he's intent on writing a book. And he starts, he just keeps starting the book over and over and over again. And his attitude gets to be, he's like in his 40s or 50s by the time uh, we meet him. Um, and his attitude is, I just want to get this thing done. It doesn't matter if it sits in a drawer. Um, I just want to get it done. Um, he'll try to get it published, whatever. But uh, if it doesn't, it doesn't matter because it's out there in the universe. Um, even if it doesn't pierce the popular consciousness in your own perception, it's there. So get it done. Just get anything done. Um, I don't know how to get something published or produced or um, reproduced or sold. I don't know how to do that. Um, I, think, I think it's sort of something that happens when you make it possible to have something that's publishable. So that's the first thing you got to do. Just get it done. Does that make sense? Well, it makes a lot of sense to me because as I've told you before, me and my best friend from high school, we keep saying we're going to write this comic book and we're going to send it into DC. But the problem is he lives in Alabama. I live in Missouri and none of us have gotten off of, has gotten off our butts yet and started writing anything. <laughs> all we got, all we have so far is the title and that's took us about 10, 15 years to say, here's the title, <laughs> you know? And, uh, but I from know. everybody, well, you know, I've spoken with you about it. I've spoken with other artists and writers that I know from DC. Uh, and I've already told you the name of the comic that I'm trying to. Uh, I've called it the, we've called it the American Defense Force. And what it's supposed to be is the group of guys I hung out with in my high school, junior high and high school days, it was a bunch of us. So what it is, it's about real people, but it's in made up situations. You know, and uh, the story, some of the stories that I'm cooking up in my head here, which I'm not a writer by no means, I'm just trying something new to, you know, so I can just say I've, I've done this, I've done that, and it's been fun doing it. But some of the stuff I've got here worked up in my head, I'm thinking, man, I don't know if I write this down and try and turn it into a comic book or even just a novel or whatever. Some people are going to read some of these pages and go, what was he thinking? But then again, you may get somebody to... Don't ever say you're not a writer if you're writing something. <laughs> well, that's a good point, too. Like I said, I, I'm a newbie to this, so I've still got a lot to learn. I'm still wet behind the ears on it. But uh, I, I feel, you know, with me, what's in my heart, what's in my head, I feel like, you know, if it's coming to me and I think I like it, I think most of my other friends and people I know would like it too. And then again, I could be way off, but there, you know, you don't know unless you try. You don't know unless you put yourself out there and say, hey, 
here, here it is, it's what it is. Let me know what you think, good, bad, or indifferent. You know, just don't hit me with a bunch of rocks or stones. Just run me out of town if nothing else if you don't like it. <laughs> I mean, you know, so other than that. Say again? Jack here? You want to do the Jack uh, panel? Uh, I don't know if he's on yet or not. Nobody's sent me anything. Uh, who, whoever's watching this and is in charge of. Hey, sorry. Together. Um, Jack, I tried to call Jack and he's not answering his phone and don't, Kenny, don't you have his actual number? I have his phone number. I'd have to get offline. I'm on my cell phone right now to get it. But I can okay. I can cut this short now if you'd like to and get it. And as far as um, I'm concerned, yeah, we're that's because like, I don't I don't it. know anybody else who has his number. And I just tried to call him through Facebook, and he didn't answer. And I know he wrote and said he was going to come on today. So I don't know if something happened. Okay, I I will get off of here and get in touch with him and let him know we're in desperate need of getting him on here. Okay, well, everybody else can stay put if they want, and um, you guys can chat amongst yourselves until we, until we get him on. Yeah, get off mute and ask questions. Okay, I will return in a few minutes, so y'all keep yourselves company, and I'll be right back. In the meantime, uh, Elliot, we just want to say thank you again for joining us today, and thank you for being a guest this weekend. We appreciate it very much. Sure. Glad to have you, my friend. Thank you. And I know oh, you're just, what's that? Oh, there you are. You're, you're oh, I, I, I don't want to subject people to this any more than they have to. It's, if right. it's absolutely necessary, I've got to, but otherwise, yeah, you know, I'm scaring the kids. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 I was going to ask, are you going to stick around for our panel today on um, why the world needs Superman today? I could. Awesome. It'll be it coming up uh, after Jack's panel. So we'll be doing that. And. Like I said, we'd love to have you. I think uh, Jeff is going to be joining us, and Kelly, and a couple of other folks. So, okay, cool. In the meantime, if anybody has any questions for Elliot, now is a golden opportunity. Please chime in. Oh, uh, Sassy may have muted your microphone, so you just have to unmute yourself. <laughs> I think we have one coming up from uh, Jeff. Jeff, do you have a question? Well, it's it's a little bit more of a comment. Uh, regard, it's a shame that Kenny isn't on right now because it was really to him when he was talking about he, uh, after 10 years, he got the title to his comic book. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's it, it, the first thing it reminded me of Stephen Wright, who said, yeah, I'm writing a, a book. Uh, I got the pages numbered so far. <laughs> and uh, the with me, I found that as soon as I was able to find a comfortable for me place and way to write, that was my first priority. Once I got that, things took off. Like since March, when we started this quarantine, I finished a stage play and I finished two screenplays. So it, it's all a matter of putting your butt in the seat, whichever seat is the most comfortable. And if you have to spend some time meditating in front of a blank page, then you do it. But eventually, when, once you start, you keep going. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like they say, you know, a beginning, a middle, an end. And even, you have to, it goes faster once you know your own particular style and way of writing. Some people start with an idea and they start at what they think is the beginning and they just take off no matter where it takes them. Me, I need to outline because otherwise I ramble. I'm more of a structural person that way. But whichever way is the most comfortable for you, that's what you do. And you, you, you try different things until you really glom on to something that uh, makes you comfortable writing. 
because if you're comfortable writing, you're going to want to keep on doing it. If I can add to that, I think the key thing, like you said, it's writing every day. It's sitting down, even if you're only writing for 10 to 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I always tell prospective writers, uh, what I do is when I work the day job, I, I do a job which is seasonal, which we work like eight months out of the year, and I work the rest of the time out of the house. When I tell people what I do is I take a notebook with me at all times.